Okay, I guess we could start right now. Uh, so hi guys, this is Chris from Dora Hacks, and uh, today we are very happy to have Jeff Bennett, who from Balancer Integration Team, uh, sharing the topic about a guide to building applications on top of Balancer V2 with us. And uh, this is also gonna be the very last uh, Polygon workshop series. And uh, before he start, uh, please allow me to briefly introduce the background of this workshop. Right now, Dora Hacks and the Polygon are co-hosting the Polygon Grants Hackathon, which is the very first global Polygon-centric hackathon, and also the very first Polygon Quadratic Funding Grants, where we will all use Matic token as the main voting and donation currency. And we're really looking forward to see all the uh, to see all the amazing new projects building on the Polygon network. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Jeff to start his workshop. And remember, guys, if you have any questions during the session, feel free to ask in the YouTube and Billy the chat room. And uh, thanks for joining us today, Jeff. Feel free to start when you are ready. Thanks. All right, yeah, we'll, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to sponsor this. We deployed on Polygon as our first L2, and I've gotten some great traction there. And it's also opened the door to many exciting partnerships. And it's just uh, it's wonderful to have a place to go when the network gets busy and the, the gas gets expensive. So let me uh, start here. Okay, how's that look? So uh, you can see the, looks good. Uh, you know, right, you see this graphic from Dune Analytics, how we've uh, we've grown on Polygon just a few short weeks. Most impressive to me is the 8,500 LPs. I think we have 12K or so on, on mainnet. So that's a significant uh, traction fraction. And we have almost hundred pools, despite not having a pool creation UI, um, there is an SDK. So I, maybe I made 10 of those myself and other team members and ballers made more, but still I'd say at least half of those were created organically by the community. Uh, and we don't even have UI support yet for many of the advanced features or even basic pool creation. So I expect this growth to, to accelerate, especially on Polygon where the gas costs and fragmentation is much less of a problem. Uh, so not everyone's familiar with Balancer or our history since V1, especially Polygon natives. So that's the first topic. So what is Balancer? Uh, it's two things, primarily. It's a decentralized token exchange, right? And also an asset manager. It's focused on optimizing returns for the liquidity providers who make the DEX possible. So one way to think of it is as a kind of generalization of the DEX anyways, as a generalization of QuickSwap. So Balancer does support, you know, two token equally weighted liquidity pools with fixed fees and an Oracle but also pools with many more tokens with unequal weights and dynamic swap fees. But the, the biggest generalization really is of the AMM itself. So Balancer V1 was an AMM product. There was one core pool that worked a certain way. And even the smart pool that came later was just a wrapper. There was really still only one pool. V2 is an AMM platform. So on V2, you can create entirely new pool types with arbitrary math and logic, as long as they implement the very simple vault interface They'll interoperate just fine with the others. So at launch, we had only one pool type. We meant to have two, ran into some issues with the math, wasn't quite ready. And uh, one principle of balancer is quality always wins. If we haven't made every effort to ensure correctness and security, we don't release. Uh, but a few short months later, we've expanded to six pool types, plus one integrated third, pool, third party pool type, and several more are in uh, development. So I think that tips the scale a bit toward asset management as our main strength and focus area. Though of course the DEX you know, fuels everything. And this, this diversity uh, of pool types, it lets us address many asset management use cases, smart treasuries, token launches, longer term HODL pools, and also lets us appeal to the full range of, of users. So for all the way from DJ yield chasers to more conservative long-term index fund investors. So the goal is to make Balancer truly a one-stop shop for liquidity. You can trade in the DEX with a gas cost similar to Uniswap or QuickSwap. Uh, we're now integrated with Gnosis, so their solvers make it even cheaper on L1. 
and we have stable pools comparable to Curve. So you don't have to leave the platform to do pretty much anything you need to do. Uh, you can use Balancer as a secure smart wallet. Just keep your funds in the vault and invest, withdraw and trade without any transfers. And if there's anything we don't do now, then we or a partner can just make a new pool type for it. And that's the most powerful feature of all. If you, if you wanted to build on Balancer V1, you had to fork the protocol. And V2, you can innovate within the platform and just directly use the security and accounting of the very well-designed vault. But of course, the DEX is critical. Uh, so I should look at that first. And the core of that is a smart order router. That's the engine uh, behind the trading interface. And if you integrate with Balancer, um, if you're doing a project that's going to you know, use it as part of a larger thing, this is probably the piece that you'll, you'll integrate with first. Um, so say you want to buy 100 bal, you have a kind of a less common stable coin like, like true USD. Uh, when you know how much you want to buy, that's called a swap. You're doing a swap. It's called a given out because you want to receive a certain amount and the pool calculates how much you need to pay for it. So of course you want to pay as little as possible, but in the world of AMMs, that's not as straightforward as it, as it may seem. You know, we don't have oracles. Uh, prices are determined internally by the weights and balances. And since swaps change balances, they also change prices. So in this case, yeah, maybe you have three pools. You know, pool A might have only 20 bal, so you can't, and you don't want to unbalance it too much. So it might not even use that one as part of a large trade. It could take everything from pool B, the big one, but maybe that would leave a price difference between the pools that could be arbed. In that case, you've you've left value on the table. So the SOR essentially tries to make you the arbor. Uh, trading with the optimal set of pools so that they all end up at the same price after the trades, you capture all the available value. And uh, if there are no gas costs or gas limits, then the ideal would be trade with every pool and choose the amounts that would level all the prices. Um, so we try to do that on uh, one, but on Polygon, where gas is much less of an issue. So I'd expect the SOR to actually approach that ideal there. Um, on L1, we know the, the cost can pretty drastically influence it. So and I don't want to go into the, we don't have time to go into the graphics here in detail, but I can describe at a high level the advances um, and, and, and why we couldn't just reuse the SOR in V2, even though the V2 SOR can still trade with V1. Um, and two reasons. Uh, one is that V1 had only one pool type, as I said, and that was possible to linearize it, the math, and that made the math a lot simpler. Whereas V2 has many different kinds of pools and some have very different math. Stable pools looking at you, uh, and that's not really possible. So, and also V2 allows a kind of nested trading coming soon, which is very powerful. If you have you know TUSD inside a big stable pool with Dai and USDC and Tether, and you use that in a weighted pool with you know Bal or something, then you'll be able to trade uh, Bal for the inner like Dai or Tether as if you had a whole set of Bal stablecoin pools. And really, there's a third thing too. Um, in V1, since the tokens were stored in each pool contract, every hop on the SOR was a token transfer. But with the V2 architecture, everything happens inside the vault. So the only token transfers happen at the end. And if you use internal balances, you know, not even that. So how are, how are assets managed uh, on Balancer? There were, there were two main issues really with, with V1. Relatively high gas costs, mainly because every every hop was a, was a token transfer, uh, which made us less competitive with some alternative DEXs, uh, and a UI that was less user friendly than could have been desired. So for V2, we hired UX specialists, redesigned the UI from the ground up, from a UX perspective, with the goal of simplicity and transparency. And uh, actually, because of that trade off, that's why many of the more advanced features of E2 aren't even in the UI yet or used by integrators for the most part, and they're really la largely untapped. So there's lots of opportunity for further growth here and improvement in hackathon projects. So uh, for gas efficiency, we, we did the big obvious things like centralized token storage, that, that, which you can see here, how trades or transfers in V1 and everything's in the vault in V2, but also less obvious things. I mean, the contracts are optimized right down to the opcode level. And, even, even anticipating the some of the, the EIPs that were going to come out and have come out. So that makes possible things like internal flash swaps, right? You can see an ARB opportunity, and that's what's illustrated here. You can see an ARB opportunity between multiple pools, maybe many pools, and make a profitable trade with no tokens in at all. 
And you can do this or a regular triangular arbitrage also with no token transfers. So working up a sweat here. It's, uh, <laughs> here's the next chapter. Here's an illustration of the V2 plug and play architecture. So in the middle, we have the vault and that's uh, the fixed portion of the protocol that can't change. And it's literally a vault, there's $2 billion in it. And that handles the accounting and the security so that you don't have to. And uh, now part of the interface down at the bottom here doesn't need a contract. You can just call it right on the vault. And that's, that has informational functions like, um, and, and user balance transactions. With other parts, you do write a contract, but it just has to implement the vault hooks. Otherwise it can have completely arbitrary code. So um, I'm showing pools and asset managers and flash loans. So um, asset managers can just can change the uh, cash and manage proportion through deposits and withdrawals, or they report gains or losses with an update that changes the total. And flash loans just implement flash loans. And pools, all they have to do is join and exit. They handle pool participation and then the quote prices for swaps. And I don't want to have the graphics cluttered, but you can picture, you know, 20 of these uh, pieces all fitting together and they're just uh, interchangeable. Another great feature the vault provides um, for integrators, especially, is the set of query functions. So we have uh, query join, query exit, query batch swap. Uh, through some Solidity sorcery, uh, these run the exact same code as the real functions. They just revert at the end with encoded results. So, uh, and we have SDKs you know, to simulate everything, both approximately for speed and, and exactly for UIs and integrations. But this way you can see precisely what the system will do without actually doing it. So now we have other pool types coming up, a little more detail here, but so far there are two families of internal pool types. So one group uses the, the constant product weighted math, um, essentially the same as V1. And the other use a stable math, which is meant for pools that hold pegged assets similar to curve. Uh, so we have regular weighted pools um, going left to right here, which are very similar to, to V1, eight, eight tokens, fixed weights. We have the famous liquidity bootstrapping pools that are, have successfully launched many projects. Most successful, I believe, uh, was 40 million, raised 40 million over a weekend on 100 million volume with almost a million in trading fees. So that's been a very successful uh, thing. And they're happening on V2 as well now. We just had a 70 or a $17 million one on, on, uh, on V2 just recently using copper, copper launch. So, and then we have investment pools, uh, which I launched last night, <laughs> the first version. Um, and these have all the, the features of LBPs, except of course they allow uh, investment, uh, public LPs. So they're designed for higher token counts and they have management fees. So there's an incentive for issuers to make uh, pools that, that people can invest in for a longer term and steady organic gains versus just yield chasing. So it's something, it's, uh, you know, we aim to provide value after the yield chasing phase is over. Um, and uh, the full featured version of these will be coming months later. Um, it'll have circuit breakers, uh, you know, for uh, protection against rogue tokens and things like the mint, the infinite mint cover bug that we, we encountered before and mutable tokens and transferable ownership and much more to come. Uh, there. Uh, then we have the weighted two token pools and those uh, kind of a hybrid, they use the weighted math, but they also have resilient oracles. And all of our core seed pools are actually of this type. Now on the stable math side, we have uh, regular stable pools up to five tokens. Uh, the biggest one being our, our stable three, uh, which is DAI, USDC and USDT. Uh, and then we have metastable pools and those accommodate soft peg tokens. So when, when the ratio is not one-to-one -one, like it is with regular stable pools and those use rate providers. And those are also two token pools only uh, because they support the resilient oracles. Uh, so a common application is what we mentioned before with nested pools. You can pair a new stable coin with a basket of other stable coins and trade them all as if you had a big set of pools with all the combinations coming soon. Um, and finally, realizing the, the promise of balance or flexibility, we have third-party pools with completely different math, 
that were developed outside balance or by partners. So in this case, uh, we have the, the element pools, element finance. You can find out all about them uh, by following the links in the bottom of the web app. And if you've been following since uh, Balancer V1, you might be wondering where are the smart pools? Remember we had the, the smart pool wrappers on V1. Well, I like to say uh, all V2 pools are smart you know, uh, to varying degrees. So they, they, have, they all have owners. There's uh, governance and permissioned operation support built in. And you, you can't have completely trustless pools like V1 shared with, uh, with fixed fees or it can have dynamic fees. And as I mentioned, our, our, cool, our core pools have fees optimized off-chain by Gauntlet um, to maximize the LP returns. So going one level deeper yet, <laughs> um, this is still simplified, but it, this is our attempt at, now we're getting into kind of the, the contract hierarchy level. Like if you were gonna actually build on it, what are you looking at? You now you're, you're basically looking at this. Um, and it, it shows our attempt to organize the code to make this as modular and extensible as possible. Um, of course, there's a trade-off here. It has to be, you know, we have to release actual pools and they have to be performant and gas efficient. Um, and that requires some optimiza optimization that's at odds with full generality. Uh, and of course it has to fit in the bytecode, but we did the best we could. So um, I'll go through this briefly. Uh, we have the, you know, the top of the base pool authorization, which interacts with the authorizer for, for permission functions. And some are governance only, like pausing pools and emergencies or turning oracles on, controlling delegated swap fees. That's how what Gauntlet calls through. Um, or you can also customize it and add new permission operations for new pool types. Because again, they're completely generic. Now base pool, right under that, has the token storage and scaling interface, but it's not implemented. So that allows tokens to be mutable, uh, potentially. Um, this is another thing of, of V2, right? In V1, um, you had eight tokens and that was fixed and that was because that was how the math was written. Or that was how the, that was in, in the core protocol um, and you couldn't change it. And now you can. Um, so scaling is a thing we use for numerical precision. So the vault does all of its calculations in 18 decimal fixed point. This is an important thing to know if you're integrating, um, which is how we ensure the math works and the errors are bounded. But to keep it simple for users, um, all the IO is done with native decimals. So base pool has helper functions to deal with that. And uh, def it defers the token storage to derive contracts. So if you're calling things directly, you need to do, the, do that too. Um, there's a base contract for all weighted pools. That's the base weighted pool. And that introduces the interface for handling weights, but again, defers the implementation to derive contracts. So that way, because that impl implementation is deferred, we can have standard weighted pools where the weights and tokens are immutable. And, and then we can also have LBPs where the tokens are immutable, but the weights can change. And then we have investment pools where everything can change. All right, and then, and then we have, of course, the stable and metastable pools, which don't derive from base weighted pool and they don't have weights at all, but they do have tokens and they, and they have uh, pool, pool participation the same way as the others. So that's, that's kind of how that, and then we have the sampler plate you know, of this two token weighted pools where it kind of picks and chooses um, and they're, they're, they're weighted pools because they use the weighted pool math, but they also have the Oracle and that, that makes them two tokens only. Uh, so you can see how with this, if you wanted to make a new pool, new pool type with a new feature, you can see where that might fit into the hierarchy here. Um, of course, the, the devil's in the details and there are a lot, of, a lot of devils here. So as we've discovered ourselves working on the investment pools, it's pretty hard to make a non-trivial pool type just by deriving and over, overriding. You, you probably won't be able to. Uh, we've always needed to do some, some base class surgery to accommodate it. So it's not necessarily easy to make a new pool type, but it's certainly a lot easier than building your own AMM, right, from scratch or trying to duplicate the vault functionality. So how do we make development as easy as possible? Uh, we created um, the balancer examples repo as a GitHub template. And that's a template is an especially fork friendly uh, mono repo variant. And uh, that's what you can start with. So uh, you don't want to fork the mono repo. That's the main code base. It's not only is it very complicated with uh, workspaces and lots of pieces you can't change anyway, right? like the vault and uh, other pieces that won't be relevant to your project. 
Uh, not only that, it's, it's also under very active development. <clears throat> this PR is flying every which way. I think there's 17 PRs out now um, and base class is changing all the time. So if you just grab master at a random time, no guarantee what you'll get. Um, <clears throat> and we, we have temporary things in there that we're gonna back out later. So, uh, so we do have published NPM packages and a stable branch that corresponds to those packages. So if you do need to look at the source code of what you're importing, uh, that's where you'd look. You normally you'd use it by, especially if you're just an integrator, just calling things, um, you know, calling functions in the vault or whatever that you, you would just import from the NPM. Um, so this example repo uh, you know, runs out of the box, it deploys the vault, pool factory, um, and then you can run simple scripts that'll verify you have a, a working dev environment. So we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, to close out the slides, I'll show some resources and maybe throw out some ideas. Um, so this, uh, the main way to get in touch with us during the hackathon is on the Discord. Um, I think this is the main Polygon uh, Discord in this case, and uh, it should be called Sponsor Balancer. There is a uh, media, there, well, uh, the blog has a lot of Medium articles. Um, this is an older one. This is when we first launched uh, V2, so it's a bit dated at this point, but it still shows the, it's still accurate at the high level. Um, and we, of course, we have many more recent articles that show things that are, are in development and that are coming out. And also on the Balancer uh, Discord, we have, um, you know, things like the the cross, up, cross team updates and, and things, uh, community updates and community calls. Um, but we'd ask during the hackathon for hackathon related things, you know, use, use the Polygon sponsor balancer uh, channel. Uh, here's the GitHub link here. We have the, here's the, the balancer examples is the repo I'm gonna talk about. And the mono repo is the full thing. Guides and APIs, these are pointers into the docs. The docs are a work in progress, a bit rough, a bit rough still maybe, uh, incomplete. Uh, Feedback is always welcome on how to add to and improve that. Um, and then we have some SDKs, notably Balpi, which is uh, for pool creation. We don't have a GUI for pool creation yet. So unless you're launching your LBP on Copper, which has a GUI, um, the only way you can create a pool now is write a script or use this much easier um, Python uh, library, SDK. And I'll, I'll go over that too. Um, and as far as ideas of what to do, I was trying to think of something Polygon specific. Um, of course, it's a EVM compatible network, so everything's pretty much the same. It's like, you know, much like Canada's just America with lower temperatures and higher taxes. The, the code level Polygon is just Ethereum with lower fees and higher transaction rates, right? Um, but what's different, of course, is the partners and the projects. So, GDAO is a big one. I think that I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, anything involving them would be interesting, I would say. Um, now, maybe there's something that's only possible on Polygon because L1 would be too slow or too expensive, or maybe the protocol you want to integrate with is Polygon native and not on mainnet, or you want it, or maybe you can do something with the bridge or build an arbitrage bot across different L2s. We're, all, we're also on an arbitrum, or maybe a relayer contract to manage a set of investments. I mean, you can, uh, you know, mainly just surprise us. So, all right, time to work on uh, actual balancer. Here we go. Here's my balancer shirt. We'll now look at the. This is the balancer examples. Um, so this is, again, very much a work in progress. It doesn't have too much in it yet, um, but it's also very much better than nothing um, and, and much better than throwing the whole modern repo at you and, and saying, figure it out, uh, even though the code is in the modern repo is very well documented. And we'll be adding to this continuously and uh, all feedback and suggestions are welcome as always. So as it says in the readme, you, know, you do yarn uh, to install dependencies, yarn build, uh, compiles and uh, deals with the TypeScript. And now let's let's look at what's in these packages. Um, so first, in shared dependencies, we just have, um, we have two things, really. Um, the In TypeScript, we have the setup helpers. So um, 
we're using ethers and, and uh, hard hat. So we have functions to you know, get the accounts, wait for a transaction to be mined, uh, retrieve an artifact from the NPM, that's an important piece. So you don't need to pull down source and recompile base contracts. And just a general you know, setup environment, um, general setups to and wiring it all together. Um, and then, so it has to deploy uh, the vault and authorizer, deploy tokens, approve them to the vault, mint some to the accounts you'll be using and so forth. There's a lot going on there. This kind of does all that for you. So you can kind of start on a, on a firm basis there. Now, in, a, in the contracts directory, we just have these, these token contracts that we use. Not interesting there. So in liquidity provision, this is the first like actual active thing. We're gonna add a lot more to this and add other um, directories as well. But here we're demonstrating um, in two ways, both for in TypeScript for aggregators and in Solidity for contract developers, how to develop a pool and do you know, basic operations and join exits and swaps. So if we're looking at the scripts first, um, you know, we, we set up like for a join exit, we set up the environment, um, vault tokens. Um, and then here, if you're calling, you're, you're calling, we've already deployed in the, in the setup, deployed the factory. We're deploy, we're cre calling create on the way to pool factory that creates a pool. We see the, the event it generates and now we have a pool. And then once you have a pool, um, it's uninitialized at first, you have to do an initial special kind of join to fund the pool so that the balances are non-zero and therefore the invariance non-zero and the math will work. And then after that, it's good to go. You can join exit um, and do whatever you need to on it. Um, and the tricky part of these functions uh, is always the argument encoding. So since we get an arbitrary pool code, we can't predict what kind of arguments a pool might need. So we just pass a generic ABI encoded bytes that the, that the pool interprets. So, and we define an encoder for each pool type that uses, that creates those arguments. So in this case, we have a weighted pool. So, you know, we're using the weighted pool encoder. Somewhere in here. Um, and then we do a similar thing to exit. And there's also a swap script. Um, same thing. There are two kinds of swaps and, and all of these things are called directly on the vault given the pool ID. So when, when a pool gets created, it, it, the, the vault assigns it an ID, and then that, that's how they're linked. And then all the, all the API calls on the pool use that pool ID to identify it. And it's got the address encoded in it and some other, um, the specialization and some other, other things encoded in it. Um, so this shows how like a front-end aggregator might, might use this. In, in TypeScript. So these are, you know, it has to create these, and it, and it does both a single swap. So there's just a swap that's that's with one pool. So you give it the pool ID and all the information, and it does a single swap. And a swap is always one token's in, one token's out, one balance increases, the other one decreases. Um, and it could be in, in either direction. So then that's of course most gas efficient because efficient there's no overhead. There's also a batch swap where you can chain them together. And you can you can uh, either do a bunch of independent swaps, like you could do ten completely unrelated swaps, or you can chain them together. Um, and in this case, I'm actually swapping. I'm doing two things. I'm chaining it, and I'm, I'm using the same pool. Normally, you'd, you'd hop across multiple pools, but you know it's, it's very flexible. And I can show. Yeah, I can just run it here. Um, you know, we're using hard hat. You would you would be in the, you would go into the you would you'd clone this repo. Um, you know, or, or uh, you know, fork if you're going to develop and change on, and change it. Uh, and you just yarn you go into the liquidity provision directory, and then you say you know yarn hard hat run, and you run that join exit script, and then it's going to do uh, do all the deployments on the local local hard hat uh, network. So it takes and why is this and it, it takes a bit to run, but you can see how I've been running it. There it goes. There it is live. And then you can do the same thing with the swap. And on the swap, it's also measuring the gas. So it has there's helpers in there to print the gas. So if you want to do different operations, 
and see you know whether one way is better than another way you can do that and and use the uh, and print the gas out and then finally i'll let that run oh, there there it goes so there it is it's showing that the yeah 136 for the batch swap 103 for the single swap All right, and now finally in this in this package we also have um liquidity provider contract and this is the other end this is if you were if you have your own protocol and you want to create a you have a, a smart contract deployed in, in your own protocol and you want to create a pool or deploy a pool from inside your environment this is you know how to do it from a solidity so it's basically the same thing um, doing it from solidity in this case a very simple three token pool doesn't do much and we don't have tests yet We're, we'll put some tests in there too and feel free to contribute of course the main benefit of this is the documentation really in the comments that explains a lot about what's going on it shows the pool hooks you need to override and how you need to implement the scaling and token storage interface uh, from base pool now the other thing i'd like to show is that here's valpi this is that python sdk and it has a, a good readme here of how to install and use it most people uh, will, will create pools to create pools, you would go into pool creation, and you're basically running this pool creation sample um, with a config file. So for instance, a sample weighted pool, you, you would make a pool like this, and it has which network you're on, the name symbol, all the, all the arguments. Um, and it's very user-friendly because it does a bunch of stuff for you. It handles the token scaling. You don't have to worry about how many decimals tokens are, it figures that out and scales things properly for you. So you just give it all native and, you know, in percentages. It also sorts the tokens for you because the tokens have to be sorted. It handles a lot of the details that make it pretty bulletproof. Um, so that's incredibly useful. We, we, we do have a, it's on the roadmap, it's coming fairly soon. Um, but, uh, you know, the pool UI, but uh, not quite there yet. And we have other partners also working on UIs. So that's pretty much it. Um, last slide again, this is the Q and A if you have any questions. If I'm not the right person, I will point at whoever is. Um, the, the, uh, we have the scholars and community, they're pretty active in these hackathons. Um, so they'll be, they'll be almost, they'll be kind of first line and they will escalate to you know engineers if people have other issues. Um, but um, I guess that, that's that's the end of my presentation. So open it up to questions if there are any. Uh, if we have if we have that. <laughs> uh, yeah, we do have a Q and A part. And uh, let me firstly check if there are something happening in the chat room first. <clears throat> uh, okay, so. Like, do you mind to talk about um, some like probably like next business plan for for the polygon? Uh, I mean, for the balancer that 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 could be exciting. Just maybe on products or some partnership with with some other projects, something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, we we certainly have a lot in the, in the works. Um, the, the people at the conference now would be, would be better um, yeah. than me. I mean, I know I know Cheetah is one of our, our polygon specific partners. I mean, of course, we're aggressively pursuing that on all. So we, we the rollout to L2s is slow, like we choose them very deliberately. We're not trying to, we get a lot of requests. Hey, go on Avalanche, go on um, Reef, go on here and there. Um, you know, we pick these very deliberately. So um, not only is it a lot of work, to deploy on an, on an L2, even though it's EVM compatible. I mean, it has to be EVM compatible or it's kind of a non-starter uh, for now. Um, uh, but it's still the, the you know, with, with a new L2, you have you have the, the governance and the um, signers and the community, you know, to, to even launch the contracts. And then of course there's UI work and there's support and there's usually um, liquidity mining incentives to coordinate and, so we can't do a lot of them all at once. And, right. and we only want to do the high value ones. And that's why we picked Polygon first. Polygon, you know, we, we thought was the most ready, most mature and highest value L2. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want to miss the L2 train. Um, and and I, as I showed in the 
you know, the, the slides there, we've gotten a lot of traction. It's gone very well. We, we've recently uh, deployed an Arbitrum, which is still in its, its kind of startup phase. Um, and, we, and I guess we don't have, I'm not sure what we're pursuing the partners there. We have a, a grants program. I guess that's the other thing. Um, if, if you do uh, want a partner, um, there's one, one place to start would be the grants, you know, balance.balancer.fi. Um, and there's also, you know, we have a, we have a, we've grown a lot in the last year. So we now have a biz dev department that handles partnerships and an ecosystem team. And we have, and we now have marketing and we now, you know, we have a UX. And so there's a lot more people to, to handle these things. And uh, so, yeah, uh, Jeremy is our head of growth. Like if you're, if you are a, a, a partnership interested in, like if you're a, a protocol and you're interested in a, part, a partnership with, with Balancer, it would be, you know, contact at that level, mm -hmm. our head of growth, Jeremy or Fernando himself. Um, that, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, you, you just mentioned about like the uh, Balancer Grants program. Could you like briefly introduce about that a little bit more? Because, you know, because we are doing a uh, different type of the hackathon and also we do a lot of quadratic funding grants, something mm -hmm. like that. That So just interested. In, in, in the sure. program. I can explain how it works. Yeah, so you apply for it uh, and the, there's a committee and the, and the ballers that, that evaluate them and they, you know, escalate to engineering to, for to evaluate technical ones. Um, and it's, yeah, I believe it is just grants that balance around five where you apply. And the, the grants uh, range from very small, like a thousand up to 75,000, I think is the, the top. So okay. there's a range and, right. and you know, the higher the amount, the more scrutiny it gets. I think there's a special category of like under like five and under that are, that are, you know, um, expedited. Um, and, and that's very active. There's several applications pending. There are several approved. There's also a balance for grants uh, Twitter. Okay. And that, and you can follow that Twitter and it'll show you all oh, these, this one just got approved that one. Um, I, I don't have much to do with that because that, that is, uh, you know, the head, that's the growth of biz dev people. And it's also the, the Valor community, um, committee. So I don't really have anything direct to do with that unless I get asked a technical question because some, something gets escalated, but I, I, that's what I know about it. Okay. <laughs> very active. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, let me check. Uh, yeah, I guess that'll be it for today. Cause uh, yeah, basically it's because I don't I don't have any like te specific technical background, so I I can't I, I basically I just can't can't uh, ask any questions about like the tech 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 area. But uh, I I I feel like it is a really exciting project, and actually I I I do do some yield farming at Balancer when when it at the very beginning when it started partner with the Polygon, like back to June, July. Yeah, some, sometimes like that. Yeah, so I do really like the Balancer project channel, like uh, most of the thing about it. And uh, so um, then I guess that would be it for today. I will really appreciate the efforts that you put in this workshop, cars, uh, Jeff. Uh, it is such a pleasure to, to have you with us today. And uh, I believe the whole session has been super helpful for, for like all the audience and uh, especially developers. And uh, uh, guys, definitely remember to check out the uh, Balancer's uh, Discord community and uh, maybe uh, to, to see if there are some like Balancer grants that you could help with. And- uh, uh, Your bounty is too, I think. There's also a bounty list, but mainly the grants. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is it on the like GitHub, GitHub or? I, it was. I, I, I'm not up on. I'm not 100 up on it. It used to be yes. There was a bounty in GitHub. I'm not sure what the state of that is, honestly. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, no, not a problem. I mean, I mean, just uh, if you guys are interested in the balancer ecosystem and uh, uh, just definitely check all the resources that. Uh, apply that that could be fine online and uh, yeah uh, today for this this workshop is our very last uh, polygon series workshop and uh, really appreciate uh, all, everyone who join us uh, today and uh, join us 
on the previous workshop. And uh, we really hope that you guys could doing great in the Polygon Grand Hackathon and uh, building Kickstart and start to kickstart the next best superstar project in, in the uh, industry. And uh, I wish you all good luck and uh, happy building. And also thanks very much for joining us today, Jeff, again. All right, uh, thanks. It's great Thank to you. meet you. Yeah. All right, yeah, any feedback is always welcome. We're working on improving uh, the dev docs and making it easier to work with. So any, any contributions people have are very welcome. But th thanks for having me. <laughs> Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much, Jeff. And yeah, that'll be it for today. Okay.